Thanks for joining us today at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences here at Houston Methodist Hospital. And today, we're going to talk about a new concept in vascular aging and vascular disease, and that is the concept of mechanical aging at the cellular level. So let's begin with this slide that illustrates the problem of vascular aging. Vascular aging is the major risk factor for morbidity and mortality throughout the world. As you know, uh, vascular aging can cause cerebral infarction, a stroke, can cause renal vascular disease and chronic renal failure, can cause peripheral arterial disease and aortic aneurysm, uh, ischemic bowel disease, and then, uh, of course, myocardial infarction is a major cause of morbidity and mortality uh, throughout the world, uh, which can result in sudden death or heart failure. Now, the disease of atherosclerosis is one manifestation of vascular aging, and it tends to occur at bends, bifurcations, and branches of blood vessels where the flow is disturbed, where the flow is uh, recirculating, where you have vortical flow. And there, at those sites, uh, the endothelium, which is the lining of the blood vessel, is aging faster. So we actually have sites of focal senescence within our body and within our vasculature where the cells are aging more quickly. I like to say this old adage, you're only as old as your endothelium. It actually uh, comes from a British physician who 400 years ago uh, said, you're only as old as your arteries, um, which I think was prescient. The endothelium is the lining of the blood vessel. It is a monolayer of cells that exerts tremendous control over vessel tone, vessel structure, and the circulating blood elements uh, within the lumen of that vessel. Uh, the endothelium does so by virtue of the fact that it secretes a panoply of paracrine factors, such as nitric oxide and prostacyclin, that can relax the blood vessel, that can prevent the vascular smooth muscle cells from proliferating too much, uh, that can prevent uh, adhesion of platelets and leukocytes to the vessel wall. So um, nitric oxide and prostacyclin are paradigmatic of the paracrine factors that the endothelium can make uh, to protect us. Essentially, the endothelium is a bit like uh, Teflon. And um, as we age, though, that changes. It becomes more like, the endothelium becomes more like Velcro. Things begin to stick. And that's what we see here. Um, we're looking at uh, normal endothelial cells nicely aligned with flow and uh, senescent endothelial cells, uh, which are more uh, polygonal, uh, like cobblestone paving. They, they don't line up very well with flow. And they're not very functional. They're making less nitric oxide. Uh, they have less vasodilator function. They have impaired proliferation. And things begin to stick uh, to these cells because they're expressing adhesion molecules and chemokines that allow the white blood cells to stick. So the aged endothelium is abnormal. Well, what causes aging? This slide is from a, a beautiful re review by Lopez Otin in Cell in 2013. And it takes us through uh, the different components uh, of aging, the different processes that are occurring at a cellular level. And uh, you know, let's just go through those for a minute. Um, we have uh, at the very bottom at uh, 6 o'clock there, uh, you have deregulated nutrient sensing that can lead to metabolic syndrome. You have mitochondrial impairments. The mitochondria doesn't uh, perform it properly in generating energy and starts to generate more reactive oxygen species. Um, we have cellular senescence. We, we, uh, the cells begin to uh, act un unusual. They begin to lose their, their form and function. Um, stem cell exhaustion is something that occurs. Every tissue has resident stem cells that can help in repair with damage. Those stem cells are lost over time. Um, there's altered intracellular signaling. Uh, there's genomic instability, mutations. 
telomere erosion uh, can occur. That also is a, a determinant of aging. And epigenetic alterations, um, the epigenetic markings on the chromatin are very important in determining what genes are expressed or not expressed. And if you lose those epigenetic marks or you gain new marks that shouldn't be there, it alters the gene expression of your cell. Another one at five o'clock there is loss of proteostasis. And uh, that is the uh, uh, loss of the ability to get rid of misfolded proteins, uh, which can then accumulate uh, and cause problems as this intracellular junk accumulates. So those are the processes involved in aging at the cellular level. But we think there's something missing. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about mechanical aging at the cellular level. What is mechanical aging? It's essentially an impaired biological response to physical forces with aging. Cells can sense the environment around them. Uh, they can sense the rigidity of the matrix that they're in. Uh, they can sense uh, pressure. They can sense flow. And we're going to hear more about that uh, from our students who are with us in, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, studio today. Uh, these biological responses to shear stress cause effects on gene expression and cell proliferation, the morphology of the cell, uh, remodeling of the tissue, and if they're behaving abnormal, abnormally, uh, it can result in disease. And, and now, I'm here to talk to us about a special case of vascular aging. hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome is Brandon Walter. Brandon, welcome to the studio. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Um, you're an a NMED student, our Texas A&M MD-PhD student, correct? Correct. Tell us a little about the program you're in right now. Sure, so I'm in the dual degree program. Uh, I've already done half of medical school and I did that with the Health Science Center. Right now I'm doing my PhD in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, most of my focus is on shear stress and bio, the biophysics of uh, signal transduction. So uh, a lot of this work is sort of up in, in what I do. Um, and really a lot of my focus is combining past experiences I have and the physical aspect of engineering to study biological processes in a new light. That sounds great. So you're very interested then in what happens to these mechanical forces in an aged cell. For sure, for sure. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your model system, about this uh, hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome, yeah. the cells from these children that you're studying? Absolutely, I'd love to. So. Hutchinson Guilford progeria syndrome is a pediatric genetic disease and it causes advanced aging um, and advanced senescence throughout the body. So there's several important clinical presentations of progeria, kind of like there's several important clinical presentations of normal aging. Now, the ones in progeria that are commonly seen, especially within two, three years, would be issues you have in the skeletal system. Um, and also there's very obvious changes to the integumentary system. So uh, really what you see is you have problems with the bones and problems with the skin. Now, what these kids die from early on in age is atherosclerosis. So the advanced senescence really manifests in uh, most significantly in the blood vessels of these kids with most of them passing away at around a median age of 14 from heart attack and stroke. Mm -hmm. So this vascular senescence for these kids is really, really important. Mm -hmm. So now this of course is a question of where does this come from and how do you accelerate senescence in a cell? And of course there's more than one way to do this, but how it happens in progeria is very interesting, especially since this process can occur in normal cells. So progeria is a genetic disease and it's a mutation of lamin A. Lamin A is an important protein in a cell because it is the structural protein of the nucleus for many cells in the body. Um, the specific cell distribution is cells in the mesenchyme, but the important part for that is that includes blood vessels. So you see the disease burden very significantly in diseased blood vessels. So in, this in is a protein that holds the, helps to 
form the nucleus helps to hold it together. Absolutely. It's part of the matrix of the nucleus. Yeah, it's a structural protein. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the shape of the nucleus comes from lamin A. Mm -hmm. um, and how lamin A sort of interacts with forces around the cell and of course its own protein structure itself. It's kind of like a mesh. So when it's mutated in progeria, you end up getting this sort of folded nucleus. Um, and this folded nucleus introduces a large amount of problems. Um, several of them are not related to any sort of biomechanic signal transduction. There's a lot of biological dysregulation too. So that's the nucleus of the cell that we were just saying. Could you Absolutely. Yeah, we can go back to that, yeah, back to that out. for sure. So uh, uh, above, that's a normal, oval-shaped yeah. nucleus? Above is a normal shaped nucleus, and on the bottom is where you can see the folded nucleus of a progeria cell. Um, and a lot of this is thought to be due to accumulation of progerin itself, the mutant form of lamin A, um, that's interacting with itself and other proteins to sort of change the shape. Um, and a lot of this right here also is um, tied to the pathology as as you would like to share with us, because there's several manifestations at a cellular level of what's going wrong with these cells. So, um, but of course, what we're interested in and part of the, the new data we've been collecting seems to point to that the physical changes in the nucleus are just about as important as the biological ones. Mm -hmm. So um, progeria has a whole host of biological changes and would you like to review those uh, with, with everyone oh, sure. right now? So, uh, thanks, Brandon. Um, what you're seeing uh, in, in this picture is a light microscopy of non-HGPS endothelial cells. So, th these are uh, normal mm -hmm. endothelial cells. These are endothelial cells uh, derived from the parent of a progeria child. The parent doesn't have the mutation. This is a spontaneous mutation mm -hmm. uh, in uh, lamin A. So, the parents don't have the disease. Uh, the children do. Uh, just one little fine point, we actually don't get endothelial cells from the parents, we don't get endothelial cells from the kids. What we get are fibroblasts, those fibroblasts can be um, mod modified into induced pluripotent stem cells through nuclear reprogramming, and then we can differentiate them into the cell type that we want to study. So mm -hmm. in this case, uh, we're studying endothelial cells that were derived from essentially fibroblasts of, from the parent and fibroblasts from from the child, but they are true endothelial cells. We've, we've uh, tested them in many different ways. Um, but the endothelial cells from, from the children are very different. They have reduced ability to replicate, and you can kind of see that on the right side. Uh, there's fewer cells as opposed to the uh, non-HGPS endothelial cells. Uh, they express less of the endothelial specific genes, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, VE cadherin, for example. Uh, they make less nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. They're not as good at doing their job of taking up LDL. They have shorter telomeres. There's telomere erosion in this condition. And they have this SASP phenotype. Uh, S-A-S-P stands for Senescent Associated Secretory Phenotype. And uh, they generate a lot of inflammatory materials, inflammatory cytokines. And then they have other hallmarks of senescence like beta-galactosidase expression. And uh, as you can see uh, by comparing the, the le left slide to the right, they look abnormal, don't they? They're flattened, they look up, they, they've been compared to fried eggs. Mm -hmm. They look very abnormal. Um, and then uh, this is just one bit of data from, from the, uh, the work that we've done. And uh, as you can see in the uh, left upper hand corner, um, this is an assay to detect how well the endothelial cells can form tubes, uh, form a network in matrigel. So in matrigel, endothelial cells form these networks. They're, they're trying to form capillaries, let's say, uh, anthropomorphically. Um, but um, the HGPS progeria cells are, are having a difficult time doing that. So their ability to form these, this network in matrigel is impaired. We can put the matrigel with the cells inside the matrigel into animals. So we put the um, human cells into matrigel, put them into uh, immunodeficient mice, and the, the, the cells will actually spontaneously self-assemble and form capillaries. So you actually have human capillaries forming in this immunodeficient mouse within the, the matrigel plug. And uh, if you look at the left lower uh, corner, um, 
you see, again, the non-HGPS uh, cells are pretty good at uh, forming these capillaries. What you're seeing is blood, basically, in the matrigel plug. That's murine blood, that's mouse blood that's coursing through um, the capillaries, human capillaries in the matrigel plug. And then on the right uh, of that panel, uh, you see that the HGPS cells look more pale because they have less vasculature. So um, let's go back to your work. You found something interesting with mm -hmm. these progeria cells. They're abnormal in another way. Absolutely. So tying back to this discussion on mechanical changes in aging, uh, the big question was, um, these kids have severe vascular dysfunction. And the vasculature is likely one of the most important tissues when responding to physical forces because they're constantly under some form of stress, mostly from fluid, but there's other mechanical, uh, mechanical forces going on too. So this question was, uh, it started with, uh, what if there's a problem with how they respond to physical forces and does this sort of perpetuate the disease like any biological dysfunction would? So to isolate this question and sort of figure out, is there a cellular deficit when it comes to um, physical properties, we have to sort of tailor the system to study it. Because if you study it in either a mouse model or you look at a human, you really get the whole picture. There's a lot going on there. So you want to isolate these questions. So what we did is we did just that. We tailored a system to study uh, the endothelium by itself under the forces of fluid flow. And we control for several other factors. And this picture sort of characterizes what we find, where if you look at these cells here, uh, these are subject to fluid shear stress, and it's unidirectional. So it's only going in one direction. Um, and they don't really align. There's several cells that are going almost perpendicular to flow. It's as if there's no fluid shear stress being applied in the first place. And normally you'd see if they were normal endothelial cells, they'd start lining up with flow. Absolutely. You'd start to see some form of directionality going on here. This and is beautiful histochemistry. Can you tell us a little bit about your staining? What, what we, what we, what's, you're, you have, you're showing the cells here on this high power microphotograph. Tell us of the staining that you did. Yeah, absolutely. So the staining that I did here is, of course, actin is how we do alignment. Actin is a cytoskeletal element. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the parts of the cellular cytoskeleton which gives a shape to the mm -hmm. cell. Mm -hmm. um, and it aligns with flow. So cells will move their actin cytoskeleton in response to fluid flow. Mm -hmm. It's a really important part of sort of testing how endothelial cells measure. Mm -hmm. The other stain is YAP. So YAP is an interesting protein. It controls several things. One of them is cell proliferation. Um, but another thing that YAP controls is uh, endothelial inflammation. And this is more recent, uh, a more recent discovery. But as it turns out, YAP is also mechanically sensitive. Hmm. So it's a protein that changes its activity based on the stiffness state of a cell and stiffness state is a little bit of a vague term um, and that's partially due to how our understanding of how YAP works from a physical standpoint is not quite clear yet. Um, but what we do know is that it very clearly is activated when cells experience some form of high stress. So any sort of stiff substrate would cause YAP to translocate to the nucleus, activate and cause cell proliferation. Uh, conversely, something very soft would turn it off. Um, another thing, though, is uh, it's regulated by cell size and cell contact. So this sort of controls how cells um, would proliferate in response to other cells around them. And many people may be already familiar with YAP from the HIPPO pathway, which is implicated in cancer. This was discovered long before we actually started looking at YAP in the context of mechanotransduction. Um, but it sort of plays two roles there, and they're also different pathways. So it's a little bit interesting how YAP works. Um, so YAP itself, though, also plays a role in endothelial force sensing. So when endothelial cells are subject to a high laminar shear stress, so for example, an arterial cell in the aorta of the body, like the descending aorta, where you have a nice laminar flow, high laminar flow turns off YAP, which is great for the endothelium because you don't have a proliferative state. 
and you don't have endothelial activation. So YAP can turn on endothelial cells and they can start expressing uh, inflammatory cytokines. That goes back to the SASP phenotype that you discuss about, which is related to aging. But this general idea that it sort of lowers inflammation in the vasculature and prevents atherosclerotic progression. So this is a mechanosensitive protein that's in the cytoplasm. And um, if the cell finds itself in a, a stiff, hard matrix, YAP translocates into the nucleus and starts turning on genes involved in inflammation. Mm -hmm. And um, however, if the, if, the, if the cell is in a soft, pliable mm -hmm. matrix, like a normal va vessel, mm -hmm. then uh, YAP is turned off. It doesn't yeah. go into the nucleus. And the other thing that I found interesting is that uh, normal laminar shear stress, nice fluid flow, um, turns off YAP also and, mm -hmm. and reduces this inflammatory stimulus. Yes, yeah. that's consistent with everything else that we've been studying in, in the endothelium. The endothelium likes laminar flow, likes a sh some amount of shear stress. It's exposed to it all the time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's very much uh, an important regulator of the cell cycle mm -hmm. and in the case of vasculature, endothelial health. And it's very much a gradient, which is one of the most interesting parts of YAP in that you can, the how it behaves from soft to hard is, is sort of graded in that it can be dependent on um, how soft or stiff your matrix is. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is if you have something that's really, really soft, you can actually just completely shut it off and your mm -hmm. cells will die. Mm -hmm. So you can induce apoptosis if you inactivate it entirely. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the There's a Goldilocks zone. There's absolutely a Goldilocks zone. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the reasons why figuring out how it works and also figuring out exactly what these Goldilocks zones are are very, very important. So restoring or maintaining appropriate sensing of physical forces seems to be very, very important for vascular endothelial cells. So, so how we do this, to go back and how we generated that image to show people that endothelial cells uh, do not respond to shear stress is we use something called a vessel on a chip system. Uh, there's several ways to approach this. So this one is a microfluidic chamber. Uh, and we basically seed cells and create a little endothelium. And we use that to study uh, these cells under fluid shear stress. And the importance of this one is we control everything except the cell. The cell is the experiment. So any deficit we find, we know can be tied back to the cell itself and not an external influence. So if we apply a protective shear stress, so something that's um, high magnitude for an arterial cell, for example, and unidirectional, nice laminar, uh, and the cell still doesn't respond to shear stress, then we know there's something wrong with the cell. It's mm -hmm. not something due to an external environment, which is very important in vasculature as well. So what we find here is we want to validate the model, of course. So because this is a model, we have to make sure it works. So these are just using a normal cell line that's commonly used in vascular labs. These are called HUVEX. Um, but the idea here is if we apply low and high shear stresses, so venous and arterial, we see that gradient in YAP. And if we start altering the flow in such a way that it produces this sort of disturbed flow, as we call it, or any sort of altered flow that activates endothelium, we see that uh, the cells here are activated yet again. So these are normal cells that you're, you're just testing your model right now. Absolutely. Okay. So all of these are normal cells. And the idea here is if we show that uh, normal cells behave as expected in this model, then we can start to use it to study pathological cells where the response may not be understood. Mm -hmm. Um, so here what we see is under oscillatory flow, so basically disturbed flow, YAP translocates to the nucleus. YAP is in red. Um, so let me start there. That's very interesting because mm -hmm. oscillatory flow, that's the kind of flow that you might get at a bend or branch or bifurcation, for example, in the aorta. The yeah. flow is going back and forth uh, with uh, systole, diastole, you get this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So in the lab, we use this to simulate one form of disturbed flow. The interesting thing about disturbed flow is there's more than one way to activate an endothelial cell. Um, and this is just one way that we can show it. Mm -hmm. But like you said, this one definitely occurs in the aortic system with the bends and the bifurcations. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where you would actually see that type of oscillatory flow going back mm -hmm. and forth, which endothelial cells do not like at all. Um, 
just to confirm this, we look at gene expression after the fact. CTGF and anchored are targets of YAP. And the idea here is that if you look at targets of YAP when it's activated, they should probably go up. And what we show here is they go up. So what this is telling us all together is that we are capturing this sort of endothelial activation under disturbed flow regimes. Um, this one is done under the arterial regime, HUVEX or a high shear cell. So this is sort of the, the, model, um, the model gene expression to show that we mm -hmm. can sort of flip between and um, atheroprone. So the black bars there represent oh, uh, yeah. the response during uh, normal protective levels of fluid flow. Yeah. And the, the white bars are uh, the flow that occurs with the abnormal disturbed flow, the oscillatory flow. Yeah, absolutely. So we put these cells on the system, and that's where that picture came from last time. Ooh, I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> so when we look at these cells under shear stress, um, and you compare the progeria cells to the parental controls, the most obvious thing that stands out is you actually do see some form of actin alignment in the parental uh, control cells. You can see on average the actin is going in a certain direction. If you look at the progeria cells, you have several instances of almost perpendicular actin alignment. I guess that's best seen in the uh, green uh, right. act where the actin is stained. Uh, you can see that it's aligned with the parental cells, the non-HGPS cells, but in the cells from the children with progeria, they're, they're not lining up. They're not lining up, absolutely. And that's the most stark thing we see when we study these cells on the chip. Uh, we also looked at YAP for both of these, um, but these are also microvascular cells. So these studies are things that we want to compare in multiple shear regimes mm -hmm. before we sort of start making conclusions about YAP. But here you can see that there is, there does appear to be some difference between how they respond because for the most part, progeria has YAP for the most part localized in the nucleus. Um, however, to really conclude that, we would want to make sure that we study a few more shear regimes. But the most obvious standout here is absolutely the cytoskeletal mm -hmm. dysfunction. So now this sort of asks the question of, there seems to be a lack of response to a physical response, physical, um, to a physical force. And to study this requires a different sort of approach than um, looking at biological pathways, which are very, very important because we need these to tie to these physical responses. But a lot of the question would sort of lie in how do you ask this question of where does a cell go wrong when it responds to that physical force? And why does progeria just almost pretend as if there's no fluid shear stress? So doing this requires sort of a kit of biophysics, mm -hmm. and we'll get into that just right now. Great. Well, you're a rising star in biology, and uh, it's great to have you in our department. Uh, we're now going to turn to Chad Hobson, who's going to talk a little bit about um, how you assess mechanics at the cellular level. Uh, Chad Hobson is a graduate student at the University of North Carolina. He's in the biophysics department there, so he's studying the physics of cells. And we're going to have him uh, talk a little bit about that in just a moment. But first, uh, Chad, welcome to our program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here. So you're at UNC, and, and you're in the biophysics department there? I, I'm actually in, in the uh, Department of Physics and Astronomy at UNC. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm uh, just wrapping up my PhD. and. Uh, a lot of the work we do in our lab, I'm in Rich Superfine's lab, is uh, studying mechanical properties of single cells as well as uh, developing new techniques to uh, get at these questions of what are the mechanical properties of cells. Great. Well, tell us a little bit about uh, the, the uh, instrumentation you're using in your laboratory. Yeah, sure. So in our laboratory, I, we've developed a, a suite of different techniques, but most recently, um, the thing we use a lot is uh, atomic force microscopy. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, but what we have developed is this unique instrument where we're able to uh, mechanically probe cells, push them, uh, measure forces while simultaneously imaging them uh, with really high spatial temporal resolution. That allows us to study not only what are the forces going on in these cells, but also what are the dynamics uh, and how is 
the shape of the cell responding, how are certain proteins responding to mechanical force. So um, what I'm going to get into now uh, is just talking about how we start to assess mechanics at, at a single cell level. And what I want to do is kind of introduce three broad techniques uh, and talk a little bit about each of those techniques uh, specifically. So the first um, technique is uh, this class of force probes. And so these are tools that we actually use to extract a, a measure of force from a cell. The next kind of class of techniques is uh, microscopy based techniques. And you've seen some of these uh, beautiful images already, uh, but we can use fluorescence microscopy to look at specific proteins uh, in a given cell and understand how they vary under different conditions. And the final is uh, computational methods. So we can actually use uh, computational modeling, simulations, and things like that to kind of piece together uh, how cells respond mechanically to their environment. So the first thing I'll focus on is force probes. Like I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, atomic force microscopy is uh, the specific technique we use and it's become one of the most popular techniques. It was actually originally developed as a uh, means of imaging, hence the, uh, the microscopy term. And the beautiful thing I love about this technique is it's so simple at heart, but really complicated to actually implement. Uh, the idea here is you have a flexible cantilever uh, and you were talking on, on the scale of a few hundred microns in length and we can bring this cantilever down with really fine precision uh, and physically squish a cell and the whole time uh, we're doing this based on how much that cantilever deflects uh, we can measure forces and we can measure deflections of these cantilevers on the scale of angstroms uh, and that corresponds to measuring forces at the 10 picanewton level. But the range of forces we can measure goes all the way up to um, tens, 100 nanonewtons. So we have a really big dynamic range of forces that we can study. The next technique is a uh, micropipette aspiration. So this has been made popular by several labs who are studying mechanical properties of cells. And the idea here is you have a uh, pipettes and you can apply a pressure to the end of that pipette and you bring it up against the cell and it forces a, a it creates a, a suction a pressure gradient that then draws in a protrusion uh, as you can see in this this schematic here um, and so what you're actually looking at here is not specifically forces but um, how this protrusion length changes over time and this gives you a sense of kind of what the viscosity of a cell is like um, what the viscosity of the nucleus is like and the final technique, uh, and these are just three of many, but uh, these are kind of three of my favorites, is uh, micro manipulation. And the idea here is you, you can bring in two micro pipettes with really fine control. Again, we're talking kind of nanometer scale. You attach one micro pipette to the edge of a cell and you attach another to the other edge. You can stretch, you can pull with one pipette and monitor how much the, the other pipette on, on the opposite side deflects. And if you kind of understand some of the mechanical properties of the pipettes themselves, you can back out you know, how much force it takes to stretch that cell. And, uh, you know, there's, there's many other techniques, uh, one specifically of interest to this discussion of endothelial layers is um, actually stretching of substrates. So you can tug on substrates and see how cells deform. But next I want to talk about uh, microscopy based methods. So, these are mainly just uh, observations about um, cells that have deficient nuclear mechanics. And the first one that we've already kind of seen is this idea of the morphology of the nucleus. So this top image, uh, you're looking at laminaceae, which we've mentioned previously, in a healthy cell. And the lower image is a, uh, a laminaceae deficient nucleus. And you can see all of these rufflings, the crumbling, and severely altered nuclear morphology. The next kind of class of experience experiments that have been really popular are looking at uh, nuclear blebbing. So what this is, is actually when a, uh, a small bleb uh, protrusion uh, starts to form within the nucleus and you can actually get chromatin herniating into this protrusion. As you can see in these images, you can see DNA in that top corner leaking out of the nucleus into this protrusion. 
And there's a couple different types of nuclear blobs um, that are enriched or deficient in, in specific nuclear proteins. And the final kind of observation microscopy method that's been really popular as of late is studying nuclear rupture. So what you're looking at in this image panel is a, uh, a series of images as a cell migrates through a very tight constriction. And you can actually uh, induce rupture of the nuclear membrane. And that causes uh, cytoplasmic contents to leak into the nucleus and vice versa, you know, the nucleoplasm leaking out into the cytoplasm. And this actually results in uh, double-stranded DNA breaks and, and subsequent altered cellular function. Uh, the final kind of class of, of techniques at getting at mechanics are these computational methods. Um, and we put out a review on this topic recently, and, and I'll just kind of go over the three main classes of models that we found. So the first are these schematic models. And so these are things like uh, you would learn about in your you know first few years of physics classes where you're thinking of springs and dash pods. Everything is one dimensional. Um, and these kind of give you a great sense of the global behavior, the global mechanical behavior of a cell. You know, on, on a really helicopter view, what is the cell doing? How is it responding to forces? The next kind of class is, is an additional level of complexity. And that this is the uh, continuum mechanics approach. And so this, you're adding in now the geometry of the cell or the nucleus. You can prescribe different material properties um, you can enforce perturbations and it really starts to paint a picture of how stress and how strain is distributed within the nucleus. The final class are these uh, molecular dynamic simulations. And so now you're getting at an even more detailed level where you're thinking about, um, you know, say you can model specifically the DNA in its, in its more polymeric form. And so here you're looking at individual monomers linked via certain interactions that you can prescribe and then you can perturb this uh this system and understand how these individual interactions between single units uh, leads to a, a bulk behavior of the cell or the nucleus um each of these techniques is very powerful on its own but um, when they're combined they they give you even more insight and so that's kind of one of the things we do in, in rich superfines lab is working on kind of combined systems that make use of all three of these. So this is a, uh, a schematic of our system. And the, I won't spend too much time explaining it, but the, uh, the basic idea is we have an atomic force microscope, which I mentioned earlier. So that's that cantilever that we can just compress a cell with. And we bring a micro mirror and we can put it next to our cell of interest. And this basically turns our microscope into a periscope. So instead of looking from underneath, we can actually look from the side. And so as we compress a cell, we can image in the uh, plane that we're compressing the cell. So if you look at this next set of uh, images, this is actually a, uh, a side view image sequence of a live um, breast cancer cell. So the magenta you're looking at is a uh, is KRAS tail, which localizes to the cell membrane. And green is a, a marker for uh, nuclear histones. And you can see, uh, as you kind of work through time, the nucleus is being severely compressed. And this whole time, as we're doing that, we're measuring uh, forces. And then we combine this even further with mechanical modeling. So we can image, we can perturb cells mechanically, and then we can model the system to kind of back out, uh, you know, get a more complete picture of what the mechanics of, of a single cell looks like. That's spectacular, Chad. You've got some great tools. Uh, to uh, investigate uh, the mechanical properties of cells. Just uh, yeah. quite amazing. And um, uh, I think that uh, Brandon has some data based on this last technique that you were showing us, the atomic force microscopy. And uh, Brandon, you want to talk about what you, how you applied Chad's uh, approach to your cells? Sure, absolutely. So thanks for going over that. That was, that was beautiful. As Chad talked about, um, one of the most simple yet elegant ways to ask the stiffness of a material is to just use atomic force microscopy. It's like a cellular palpation. Absolutely. It's almost like just poking it and figuring out what's going on. Okay. So it's, it's a very straightforward way of getting the answer. So we, we did that and we just asked the question of um, 
what is the composite stiffness of these cells? So we just did an AFM over the center of the cell. And what we found is there's a very, very dis distinct change in variance in progeria cells. So they have a lamin mutation, and this lamin mutation causes a very, very widespread of composite stiffnesses that we observe. Now, of course, as Chad was talking about, there's a lot more things that go into what you observe in atomic force microscopy beyond just uh, compressing your material or your sample and getting the number that AFM tells you. And of course, the can other you, thing can you, I'm we sorry, observe, could you go over that yeah, last absolutely. slide a little bit for, for everyone that's watching? Take us through that. You're, you're actually looking at the cantilever there, uh, uh, pressing on the cell? Yeah, absolutely. So the, if we're starting on the left, uh, the two ones where you see the triangles, that's the AFM cantilever. So that's the cantilever that we imaged just to show people what we're using. You have uh, different sizes of cantilevers? There are different sizes, mm -hmm. and you can use that, most importantly, for correcting and for calculating your forces, because it would change depending on how big your, your cantilever is, mm -hmm. as well as the shape. Mm -hmm. Um, this is most useful for whether you're imaging or, or trying to figure out what the actual stiffness is. And here, I guess you're using the cantilever to image. You're, you're trying to trace the contours of the cell in this slide. Right. A lot of this cell is AFM used as an imaging mode, as Chad was mentioning. Um, so deflection imaging is sort of the bread and butter of what we report for AFM. It's extremely sensitive to all surface morphology. Uh, as you can see in the bottom two cells, you even see like these very, very fine little surface contours of the cell, and then the giant blob in the middle, with the, which is the nucleus. Um, you can also project these contours, and you can get things that are 3D, so that is in the middle on the top. And then on the bottom, you can also project it as a stiffness volume, which just sort of tells you um, how much stiffness do you have in a given portion of your AFM. And then, of course, the thing that we're really interested in, what is the actual stiffness of the cells themselves? And we report that as elastic modulus, which is just how much something deforms relative to how much force we apply. Mm -hmm. So something really, really stiff doesn't deform very much if you mm -hmm. apply a lot of force. Um, and conversely, something really soft deforms mm -hmm. very quickly, even when you apply a very, very small amount of force. So on that histogram you're showing us um, on the right, um, mm -hmm. you're showing an elastic modulus in kilopascal. So I guess that's the force that you're applying right. to deform the cell. So the elastic modulus is reported as a pressure mm -hmm. um, because it's force per unit area. But mm -hmm. yeah, it can be thought of as sort of the, the force needed to deform something. And it so looks like those are your HGPS cells are, are require more force. Mm -hmm. to, to yes, them. absolutely. Um, and the interesting thing is also some cells require an enormously large amount of more force mm -hmm. than the wild type. In fact, the characteristic of the wild type is they're actually quite tightly distributed. Mm -hmm. Whereas the progeria, you start seeing this very, very high variation. Hmm. Um, so as we were mentioning, of course, Two, we want to make sure that what we're observing is an actual stiffness change, because this would be very important, whether it's due to the stiffness or, like Chad was talking about, it's to the, due to the geometry. So we looked into this too, and as we found, just based on AFM imaging, progeria cells have a different morphology, which is not unexpected because this is sort of one of the things that everyone is familiar with in like vascular aging or other senescence, is we know the cell morphology changes. Mm -hmm. We basically here just quantified fried egg, yeah. uh, but we did it using AFM on a lot of different cells just to make sure that it's sort of housekeeping for what we want to move forward with. Mm -hmm. So as Chad was mentioning, it's when you combine these techniques that you really begin to learn the most about what's going on. So this is very nice because it's showing that these cells are flattened. The mm -hmm. HGPS endothelial cells are flattened. So Absolutely. They, they don't have quite have the same height. And they mm -hmm. tend to be larger, too. Isn't oh, yes. Yeah. They tend to be a lot larger. Yeah. Um, so this flattening definitely changes their shape. And another interesting thing is they're also very round. So endothelial cells tend to be long and elongated. Even if they're not subject to flow, you'll see most healthy endothelial cells, as you've mentioned, do have a sort of somewhat elongated phenotype. And then you apply a shear stress, and it gets even more elongated, mm -hmm. and everything sort of moves into that one direction, whereas progeria cells, they don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so using this and the stiffnesses that we measured, this is where we moved forward as well, doing uh, a combined approach to study biomechanics. Um, in 
sort of the exact same essence and rationale that uh, Chad talked about. Our approach was slightly different. Um, and there are some differences and trade-offs between the approach that we do to study biomechanics and the approach that Chad talked about. So we do a combined AFM, just like Chad, but we do uh, our geometry using super resolution microscopy, and there was a there's a specific reason for that. Uh, and then we move in, we move on to biomechanical modeling, which also uses the continuum mechanics approach. Now the difference here lies in our imaging techniques. So the benefit of super resolution microscopy is we get almost molecular level resolution of whatever geometry we want to study. Mm. So if we want to really make sure that we're studying the exact 3D geometry of these cells for how we model it and how they may respond to shear forces, uh, we get that with super resolution, which is fantastic. Now the major downside though is we can't do it on live cells which is uh, a major elegant point of how Chad approaches his work because all of his light sheet can be done on live cells, which is absolutely beautiful when you're trying to stel uh, study live cell processes. So again, it's um, these combined techniques, you, you sort of want to approach it in what is the information you want to get um, and does the way that you approach your question, does it tell you what you want? So for us, because most of what we want is sort of an extremely high resolution geometry, uh, we went with super resolution. Um, so we are working on this right now. We're currently doing the super resolution geometry. It's a very, it's a very fun technique because you get very, very beautiful images. Um, and uh, I, for, for me, that's probably the most exciting part when I run an experiment is getting that beautiful image after the fact. Um, but this is, again, just another way to study how cells may respond to physical forces by studying how these changes or how the physical properties of a cell are altered themselves. Yeah. Well, you guys are doing spectacular work, really at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences. And I think we learned today uh, a lot about mechanical aging in vascular cells. What does it mean? Um, and how do we measure it? And as you mentioned, um, the, these forces that the vascular cells feel, the shear stress, the tractive force of fluid flow, um, the um, hydrostatic pressure uh, within, the, uh, the, within the lumen of the vessel, and the stiffness of the, of the vessel wall all play an important role in modifying the behavior of the vascular cells, of the endothelial cells. And uh, that can, uh, as, as we age, you, we, we have alterations in our ability to respond to those forces you've, you've shown us, and uh, that can lead to vascular disease. I think uh, people would like to know what we can do about it. And, um, you know, the, I think that there's some, some evidence to show that we can uh, affect um, vascular aging. And uh, I think uh, I would say that most, most cardiovascular docs would, would believe that exercise, Mediterranean diet, stopping smoking, uh, losing weight, um, statins, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, metformin, these are things that can um, beneficially affect the, the vasculature. I've also thrown in uh, supplements, beet juice and grape seed extract, those have antioxidant activity and nitrites that may be useful uh, for the vasculature. You know, um, you guys have shown us today some really cutting edge technology in, in terms of uh, measuring cell stiffness. Um, it's not an entirely new concept that uh, vessels, vessels get stiff with aging. But until your work, until you worked with me in, in the department, I, I really didn't think that that was happening at a cellular level. Um, vascular stiffness is something I think of as I'm a vascular doc. I think of fibrosis in the vessel. I think of calcification in the vessel causing vessel stiffness. And vessel stiffness is a problem for older folks because the heart has to pre uh, pump against uh, greater afterload. And that can cause left ventricular hypertrophy. It can cause heart failure. Um, yeah, it causes this big, wide pulse pressure in, in older folks that have stiff vessels. But what I find encouraging about the work that you and Chad are doing is that um, the cells can become stiff with age. Cells, however, are a little bit more amenable, I think, than the matrix. Cells can respond uh, to beneficial interventions. It'll be really interesting to see where you take this work, uh, see if you can help us learn a little bit more about 
vascular aging and, and, and what we can do about it. Chad, uh, let's turn to you just for a minute. Um, do you have any, any um, uh, thoughts about uh, what your next steps are to understand uh, how cells sense force? What, what's the next thing that you plan to do? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, you know, one of the things I'm always thinking about is how does our work, uh, you know, connect all the way up to that physician level? Um, because we're really at the ground of just measuring forces in a real physics perspective. Um, but one of the things that we're interested in next is diving into a little more of um, how is the cell responding biochemically to these forces and how is that different in different disease conditions, similar to, to what Brandon's doing. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of recent work and it's a really interesting area of research on cellular mechanotransduction. And so one of my favorite things is that um, the, ex the uh, cell membrane is actually mechanically tethered all the way down to the chromatin. And so if you perturb mechanically the, um, the cell membrane, that gets propagated all the way to the nucleus and that alters how genes are expressed. Uh, and this has been shown recently specifically in endothelial monolayers uh, where stretching them regulates these, some of these epigenetic factors in chromatin. And that's actually been shown to be done for the purpose of regulating mechanics of nuclei. And so kind of where we're headed next is, you know, we have these techniques, we have these combined microscopy force techniques, and we want to start digging into you know, what sorts of biochemical responses are there to mechanical forces and why are they there? Um, what's the reason a cell responds to force? Um, is that different in different cell types? Is that different in different diseases? And how does that help us understand, you know, the relevance of mechanical properties in the context of disease? I think that's a fascinating idea that, that uh, a mechanical force can immediately affect gene expression. This concept mm -hmm. of tensegrity, which you just beautifully described, that, that a force at the cytoplasmic membrane can be sensed throughout the cytoplasm and into the nucleus and into the chromatin because the cell is in, in entirely connected, interconnected. It has a cytoskeleton uh, that uh, connects directly to the chromatin. Uh, fascinating. And then, Brandon, let me turn to you uh, for a few last words. Um, uh, you're plan you plan to be an MD, PhD. You're going to be a physician scientist. Um, where do you see this story unfolding in for your career? So I'm interested a lot in pediatric genetics and pediatrics as well for, for my um, medical interests. So a lot of this ties very closely to what I do because um, a lot of my interests is sort of biophysics and this sort of fundamental, um, the, the, the fundamental processes of like how a cell responds to mechanics, much like what Chad was talking about. Um, but I'm also very interested in extending it to disease and figuring out, you know, when these things are mutated or when you have problems with like the structure. So progerin is a, is a beautiful example of this sort of altered structure that changes mechanics, force transduction, gene expression, of connecting these mutations from clinical all the way down to that very fundamental process that is changed at the molecular level. Beautiful, beautiful, thank you. Well, I, I wanna thank our uh, rising stars, Chad Hobson, graduate student, UNC, from the physics and astronomy department, doing biophysics and um, Brandon Walter, our own Brandon Walter here at Houston Methodist, MD, PhD student at Texas A&M, uh, rising star uh, in uh, pediatric biology and uh, pediatric care. Uh, thank you both for joining me today. Uh, thank you all for joining us at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences. <laughs>